Hello and shalom, everybody. My name is Julia Jassy, and you are listening to Nice Jewish Girls, brought to you by Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Today, we are speaking with features editor at Variety, Melina Saval. Melina has built this incredible platform by discussing pop culture. The day-to-day trends that we all experience as consumers, Melina writes about in a way that is tangible and real. But she's taken her platform and she's used it to lend her voice to the stories of the Jewish community. A vocal advocate on social media and a writer who discusses difficult topics like Jewish representation in films, music, media, all of the pop culture that we know and love. In this conversation, I want to ask Melina about this experience integrating Judaism into her journalism career. Did she face backlash because of her expressing her Jewish identity? What does she think of this fairly new conversation on Jewish media representation? How did she hope to see the field evolve to continue to become more inclusive of the Jewish community? I am so excited for you guys to meet her. Let's do this thing. Melina Saval is a features editor at Variety, where she covers the human interest and entertainment beats. Her writing and essays have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Glamour, Jerusalem Post, Forward, Tablet, and various other publications. She has won two LA Press Club awards and is a board member of the LA Press Club. Prior to joining Variety in 2013, Saval wrote screenplays for Touchstone Pictures and Walt Disney Films. Saval's book, The Secret Lives of Boys, Inside the Raw Emotional World of Male Teens, was published in 2009, and she has appeared as a guest on such programs as NPR's Talk of the Nation, CBS Radio, and The Pat Morrison Show. Malia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's really an honor. Um, To get us started, can you tell us a bit about your background, about where you're from and your background as a Jewish woman? Well, I was born and raised in Boston. My parents were both born and raised in Boston as well. My mom's mother was born in Ukraine and came to the States. And my father's family, they're from Russia, and some of them are from Poland. And I grew up in a pretty um, identified Jewish home. I, I was raised as a, with a very strong Jewish identity, I would say that, in the, in the Boston Jewish community. And one thing that is really interesting is before your family was in Boston, you were all over Eastern Europe. How has that legacy of immigration and assimilation into American society affected your family to, to this day? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I guess, you know, and it's such a broad question. I could pin it to specifically what happened this very past weekend, which was my daughter's bat mitzvah. Uh, My daughter's 12. And we had her bat mitzvah. Thank you so much. And we had our bat mitzvah. And for, um, for Shabbos candle lighting, we actually were able to use the candlesticks that my great grandmother brought with her from Galicia, Poland. Wow. And so that was a really nice way to kind of illustrate the um, continuation and, you know, lineage of the Jewish women in my family. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there's so many kind of ways in which my grandparents' background, where they were from, my grandmother, who was from Ukraine, sort of affected uh, our family in various different ways, culturally, um, I think I always sort of, I don't know if a lot, if other Jews feel this way, but I think living as a Jew in kind of post-Holocaust America, there was always a part of me that sort of felt like I wasn't from the United States, even though I was born here. And even though I'm very much a Bostonian, there's always kind of been a part of me that felt sort of a connection to Eastern Europe, you know, in a strange way. And I've been to Eastern Europe many times. I've been to Ukraine I've been to Poland. Um, I've been all around. So I think that there's this odd sort of sense that when I've been there, a feeling a connection to those places, but also feeling that sense of no longer being welcome there because, you know, that's the truth. You know, the family, our family was there and then they had to leave. So it's always kind of been an interesting dichotomy of feeling connected, but at the same time, uh, ostracized from those places. But I think I remember, you know, specifically what was interesting in the in the, you know, 1980s, um, there was, you know, Russian refuseniks. There was a lot that settled in the Boston area. And I remember where I went to um, Hebrew school at that time, Prozdar Hebrew College, um, which was 
um, in Brookline, Mass at the time and is now in Newton, I believe. But there were these refuseniks that immigrated um, to the United States. And I remember being so fascinated with them because I imagined, you know, I looked at them and we spoke and they had come over just then. But my family had come over, you know, years prior. But there was some sort of like common ground that we had. And I was just so sort of intrigued and fascinated by the fact that they were coming from that same place where, you know, my grandmother and my great grandparents used to live. And I always um, I was just so interested in what their life had been like, you know, living in communist in this former Soviet Union. Yeah. So I think that there was always kind of this um, sense of connection to that part of the world that was at the same time a connection, but a sense of no longer belonging there or, you know, having been literally kicked out of of that particular part of the world, but still kind of connecting with it, if that makes sense. So there is definitely an interest in Eastern Europe in a sense that that is where, you know, we came from after, of course, you know, you go back thousands of years and, you know, we were all sort of from the Levant, as we say, in in Israel and whatnot. But yeah, that was always very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And my name too. I mean, Melina. Yeah, I was about to ask, where where does that name come from? The long answer is my father had a sister who passed away, um, I believe right after her 19th birthday. She was like 18 Mm -hmm. and then her birthday was like in April and then she died kind of tragically in a a car accident. So they named me after her. Her her Hebrew name um, was Kaya Sarah. So that was my Hebrew name. But her first name was Eileen, and then they just kind of looked for a name that sort of sounded kind of like Eileen. And Melina, although it's not a derivative of Eileen, it sort of kind of has a similar sound. They're both classic, sort of, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, Melina is, you know, a Slovak name. Melina, you know, Melina yeah. means Russian. Uh, sorry, Melina is Russian. It's, you know, it means raspberry. Mm-hmm. So um, it's, you know, and you know Joshua Melina, the, the, the actor. Of course. So it's, it's of course, actually like a yeah. very kind of Eastern European yeah name and you know the only other melinas i'd ever met uh were when i was living in israel there were a few russian girls named melina and then when i went to i did march of the living in 90 was it 90 no 94 april 94 and i remember we were in my donic actually and on one of the barracks there was a list of names of 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 jewish of jews that had been in that camp and on the top rung the top line i remember when i walked in was the name melina i for, I, I do forget the last name i have a photo of it but so the first time i really kind of saw my name anywhere else than myself mm-hmm. was either when i lived in israel and met these russian girls russian jewish girls with the name melina which again means raspberry um mm-hmm. and then when i was in my donic so it's got like a jewish there's a there's a jewish link to it Um, but a lot of people, you know, especially here in Southern California where I live, they just assume it's like M O L I N A or M E L I N A. And they immediately Mm. think it's like either Hispanic or, or uh, Hawaiian. And it's like, no, it's Slavic. It, you know, it's the only other people I've known this name have actually been, been Jewish girls. Um, just not really here in the States. So that's how I got that name. Uh, my middle name is Sarah, which is a little bit okay. <laughs> more common, but yeah, that that's my name. It means raspberry. Pivoting from that for a moment, I want to talk about your career because it's it's really impressive and you've accomplished a lot. Did you always see yourself going into journalism and media? You know, I was doing like journalism as a kid. I always knew that I was a writer. I mean, I was, you know, six years old and writing dumb little poems and such and <laughs> writing little mini books and booklets and whatnot. And I always, I always felt that I was a writer. That's just what I was always compelled to do. You know, I remember when I was about 13, I was like an on-air correspondent to this local Boston radio show called Kid Company, um, a radio show. And I used to interview like local celebrities and do these little movie reviews, um, you know, as a kid. And then I did the school paper. And then, you know, at Cornell, I I wrote for the Cornell Daily Sun, but, you know, I wasn't like an editor there. I was kind of sort of like part time, but I did do it. And then, you know, for a while I was very much, I mean, I thought that I was coming to L.A. to write movies. I mean, I thought very visually I imagined Mm -hmm. my stories, um, 
you know, uh, kind of spooling out in a cinematic way. So I came after Cornell, I came to uh, Los Angeles and got my master's in fine arts from USC. And I was, you know, a screenwriter. I was writing movies and whatnot. And then, but I still was doing journalism. You know, I think, I think there's something about how tangible journalism is that really appealed to me. You know, it's screenwriting and even books. You're working so long and so hard and collaboratively a lot of the time, and you don't know what the end result will be. And with journalism, I just really loved that, you know, you'd get an assignment or you'd come up with an assignment and you would write it, you would do the research, and there it was kind of right in front of you in a very solid way that you could literally hold in your hand. So there was always something really appealing to me about that. And then just like more and more, that's what I did. And um, yeah, I've been doing journalism and writing just literally since I was a kid. So I've never really done anything else, to be honest. I think about it. Sometimes yeah. I'm like, oh, I wish I'd gone to med school because I'm fascinated in medicine. <laughs> or, you know, I have a brother who's a lawyer. I kind of wish I'd done that. But I just, what comes out of me most organically is just words. So that's really interesting. And now you do a lot of writing about pop culture. And I want to get into that connection with Judaism in, in a little bit. But was that something that you always also gravitated to? Or did that kind of become cultivated with time? Yeah. Music, film, art, theater. Yeah. You know, I would say music and film and TV specifically. Mm -hmm. Those just all spoke to me. And, and books, of course. I, I don't remember it being a choice. I just always remember... That was sort of my comfort level. I would say, you know, today, music especially. Yeah. I don't do a ton of writing about music. I do it occasionally. But music sort of feeds me and nourishes me creatively in a way that, you know, a lot of art forms don't. And so I really, I've just always, you know, I don't even, I don't even know if fascinated is the right word. I just, I am constantly drawn to the arts, you know, uh, by no real choice. It's just, I've also, you know, the written word. I mean, if there's like a sentence that I find really beautiful, I just want to read it over and over and over again. Um, books are really important to me. So I've just always gravitated toward all that stuff. And I guess naturally have a knack to write about it. I, I do remember at one point when I was before I was on staff at Variety and uh, in December, it'll be about eight years, I was freelancing for them while I was, I, I published a book and I was researching that. And when I was just freelancing, I remember an editor there, I'll give him a shout out. His name is Stu Levine. He's no longer at Variety. He's now over at uh, NBC. Um, but I remember, you know, I was just doing some freelance for him and he was like, wow, you have a knack for this. And it like, literally it wasn't anything that I tried. It, it didn't, it kind of just came out of me. I don't, I don't, I don't really even know, you know, a lot of times people are like, would you like to teach a journalism class? And I, I'm like, I don't know how to impart in others what I know how to do. I mean, teaching is a very specific and very difficult skill to have really. And I, I, I'm, I'm deeply impressed with those who are able to do that because I, uh, I taught for a little bit here and there, like kids classes and, and high schoolers, you know, and it's really difficult. I, I don't know how to teach someone to become a journalist. I really don't. I don't know how to teach anyone to write. I just know that when I do it, it's just what pours out of me. So sure. I don't even know if it was by choice. It's just something that came out of me organically. Yeah. Another thing I found to be really impactful about your writing is that you find ways to integrate your love for pop culture with your love for Judaism. Um, so you've written about things like my unorthodox life or other representation of Jewish people on, on film and TV, whether or not we can and should be played by non-Jews when Judaism is central to our character. Um, yeah. And all of those sorts of things are all things that you've posted about, written about, discussed. Um, how did that kind of come about? Have you always been writing about that sort of stuff? Have you received pushback for it? What's the story there? Yeah, I mean, I think because like I... I uh... I mean, I feel very Jewish. I feel like Judaism is a very core, intrinsic part of who I am as a person. You know, I don't know. Is that just like my neshama or is that, you know, Jewish soul or, you know, how I was raised or a combination? Where does that come from? But, 
yeah, that's always been kind of something, again, I, I don't do it on purpose. Judaism is very much a part of who I am. And pop culture is very much a part of who I am. And so I've just always, you know, kind of seen the world through both of those contexts. Um, I guess we could think of like a specific example, you know, um, I, I don't know. Like, I guess, I guess the article that I did write about, you know, Jewish representation in Hollywood and in casting and how often, um, you know, we see characters on TV that are Jewish that are really caricatures of Jews and not really representative of Jews. That just to me, you know, that's just something that's so screaming to be written about. You know, like I, I think if you're, that was just like, I don't know how someone can ignore that if they're at all, you know, in touch with exactly. their Jewish yeah. identity. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I, again, it's just, I, I just, it's just the way in which I see the world. I mean, look, I have my, look, my Jewish background. I mean, I, I consider myself very lucky. There are, there are people that literally don't really feel comfortable with being Jewish or they don't like yeah. it or they don't understand it or they're not sure what they they even are or they're born something else. And they decide, you know, I guess, you know, maybe it's just stroke of luck or who, who even knows, you know, you could get, I'm not the most observant person, but you know, you could say, you know, Hashem made me Jewish and that's what it is. Like, I don't know, but I was lucky. I think that I was born Jewish. I feel Jewish. I'm proud of being Jewish. I like being Jewish. It comes with its various different, ba you know, there's baggage and whatnot. And it's not always easy, but, um, you know, I, you know, I, I grew up, I was going to Israel on, on, you know, Hebrew school trips and on teen tours and I lived in Israel. And so, you know, and I was going to, you know, Hebrew school and I had a very Jewish family and we always celebrated all the Chagim and, you know, I don't know. I was just, it was, it's very much a part of my childhood and my identity. So it's sort of impossible. How do you separate that from your writing? You know, like for me, it, it, it doesn't follow that I would. I mean, not everything that I write is Jewish specific. I write plenty of things just about like, you know, this TV mm -hmm. show or this movie or whatnot. But more often than not, there's definitely like a way to kind of fold in um, Jewish identity to, or, you know, layer what I'm writing about with a sense of Jewish identity. Absolutely. Again, it, you know, this might just sound repetitive, but it, it's just, it's just natural, you know, it's nothing that I really have to work at. I, you know, I mean, writing, I have to work at, of course, like yeah. you know, writing is rewriting, as I say, but I think if you have a strong Jewish identity, it just kind of infiltrates a lot of the ways in which you view even pop culture, absolutely, and, you know, but also, you know, look at, look at like, there's so many, when I think of some of the greatest TV shows and films that have come out in the past, like 10 years or so, I mean, you can even take, you can even take a show like Mad Men, for example, there's Jewish context there, you know, like Don Draper, you know, was having an affair with, you know, a Jewish woman, you know, I mean, any, any, you know, I think accurate representation of American life has some Jewish elements to it. You know, some of these great shows, um, The mm -hmm. Sopranos, um, you know, I don't know. So it's, it's, I think if you're Jewish, you notice these things and it's pretty natural to yeah. uh, incorporate them in your, in your writing. When you do incorporate them into your writing, do you face more pushback than if you were to write an article without including aspects of Judaism in it? Well, it depends on for whom I'm writing. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Variety magazine where I'm on staff, it's it's not a Jewish magazine. It's a mainstream yeah. trade publication about the entertainment industry. But I've been really lucky. They've been, they're very supportive. I actually sometimes feel like there's more writing that I should be doing in this vein. There's just so much work to be done that I don't always have the time. Yeah, I've been generally supported. Clearly, if I'm writing about a TV show, you know, I do writing about, you know, Israeli TV shows like I, I sat down with Lior Oz and I interviewed Avi Sakharov um, about Hit and Run and I've written about Fauda and um, When Heroes Fly a couple of years back, you know, Stiesel and whatnot. I mean, you know, so these are these are TV shows that are clearly have Jewish content. So no one's going to really give you pushback on that. But, For sure. you know, there's been a, there's been, a, I think, a few instances where it's been kind of difficult to kind of reinforce the idea that a particular story is merited and we should write about it. And this is important. Can you give an example of that instance? 
you know, this this May, you know, when there was the war between, you know, Israel and, and Gaza and Hamas, I think that that was a really kind of difficult time to be Jewish, um, Zionist, uh, someone who, you know, has a great love for Israel. I think that there was some pushback about, you know, what to write about, what merited kind of a story, you know, what. I mean, this kind of goes off into a tangent, but, you know, when there's when there's hate crimes against members of any other community, generally society rallies around that group of people or they have been recently and kind of throws their support behind them. That's sort of been the trend lately. But when it was happening to Jews and Jews were being attacked on the streets of L.A. and in New York. That was a difficult time. That was getting that was a little difficult getting people to understand that yeah. this is important. And look, the FBI facts stand for themselves. I mean, Jews are yeah. the the you know group that the highest rates of hate crimes in the United States are you know are are targeted at Jews. That's just a fact. It's you know um, from an unbiased non Jewish source. But so that was that was a weird time. And that's all I'll say about that. So, yeah, sometimes it can be difficult. Absolutely. And that's very much something that I think we all kind of experience. There's the notion of what anti-Semitism historically looked like. And then there is the more modern permutations of it that aren't as easily recognizable, especially by the non-Jewish world. So, yeah, kind of confronting it within and without of our own community is something that's, I think, the biggest challenge a lot of us face right now. Um, and it's interesting for, for you and your story, because not only are you a, a Jewish journalist, you're also a woman who's writing in a field that journalism has historically been a field that's not been the kindest to female writers. And there's been a ton of change in the past few decades, but it's still a field that has some room to grow. How has that affected your experience as a journalist? I mean, look, let me say this. I am lucky. Um, let's just take Variety, for example. Variety has a female publisher who's amazing. Michelle Sabrino Stearns. We have um, a whole, you know, I have colleagues, female journalism colleagues that are doing incredible things, winning awards, being honored for their work. Um, so I have to say, actually, at Variety, um, we're lucky. There's a lot of strong, um, smart, gutsy female journalists. Um, so I actually can't really complain, uh, there, but, you know, I've had a lot of experiences elsewhere, but, you know, just Mm -hmm. to focus on where I'm currently on staff, I I have to say like variety is doing an incredible job of bolstering, uh, the women on its staff and, um, you know, our, our marketing department, we've got incredible, high powered women that are just, you know, doing incredible work. So um, that hasn't really been an issue for me at Variety at all. I think it's a place where the content of your character and the quality of your work really shines above everything else. That's wonderful. I'm really interested. You mentioned that Variety is run by a woman and at other magazines, the experiences weren't necessarily as positive. Do you feel that the experience of writing for a magazine that has that really strong, powerful feminist leadership from the top has a different tone and sets a different tone for the rest of the staff than if it were run differently? I feel like I feel like I can't speak about other magazines right now. I mean, to be honest, I've been at several magazines where there's been, you know, women at the top. Yeah. I mean, you know, I there's a lot of female editors out there. Um Yeah. So but I also like this is one thing I want to make clear. I'm actually just personally um and this might sound corny, what makes somebody a great editor, what makes someone a great writer is not that they're male or female. Yeah. Like what makes someone a good person isn't that they're male or female. So I just generally tend to shy away from these ideas like even you know, this whole bury the patriarchy thing. I'm not, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, I guess I'm a feminist. I don't even, I'm not even sure I'm a humanist, but you know, I have a teenage son who, and I wrote a whole book about boys. And I think, you know, boys and men also have a very difficult time in society in a lot of ways right now. And, um, you know, so I, 
I, I really think, you know, I look, I know I've known women that have done terrible things. I've known men that have done terrible things. I know women that have been horrible bosses and I know men that have been horrible bosses. I mean, I really honestly feel like I can't base it on gender. I, I really think it's it's just about who a person is. So I try to kind of stay away from from delineating uh, people like that. It, it's really just like the content of one's character. I don't, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of amazing men too. I've had great, I mean, brilliant professors, editors, um, co-writers that are, are guys and they're fiercely talented. And I've also worked with women that are fiercely talented. I, I don't really, the division of, of male versus female, I don't know if that really serves society uh, as well as maybe we're sort of led to believe right now this this division of like women rule men are horrible like i don't really think that serves us necessarily um so i guess i don't know if that made any sense but it's it's all about being a good person being a good worker being smart and um and being great at one's job you know yeah absolutely um and that really brings us right to our our final question and how we like to end every podcast here at nice jewish girls which is what's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to a young girl listening to this about navigating the world as a Jewish woman? Be like this podcast to be a chance for everyone to feel like they have access to mentors in fields they might never get the chance to meet mentors right. in. Um, and, and with that kind of in mind, what's piece of advice you want to give our listeners? I think what's really, really, really important is to stick to one's guns. Let me tell you kind of a story of my own experience. Many times I have come up with a story idea, um, an article, a book, a script, um, a column. And I have had moments where I felt unsure of myself over the years, you know, like I was younger or even, you know, last week. Every, we all have moments where we feel like um, we don't have the confidence to kind of fulfill our own um you know, goals when it comes to our writing and we, you know, we help or, or work and we'll have a moment. We'll think, oh, we need to go to someone else for advice. And I will say, while having a mentor is very, very important, make sure that you don't align yourself with somebody who tries to change your perspective or your point of view or tells you how something should be written. So I know that sounds weird because writing classes are, um, very important, workshopping your stories, getting advice from people that are have been in the profession longer, getting feedback. And that's all key. But at the same time, I have had experiences where I put so much trust in other people that I wound up with a product where my voice was now not there. My, it was now devoid of my own creative voice. So as a Jewish woman, as a writer, as an artist, whatever it is you are, be authentic to yourself. And if you get to a point where you feel like, wait, what I'm now working on isn't mine anymore. It's yours. I would say stop because the thing is, when you do that, it rarely winds up being a product that's good. <laughs> you know, like I wound up with entire books that I took the advice of somebody else that I thought knew better than I did. And then I looked at it and realized this isn't the best that I can do. This isn't really me. And then turns out the person that told me to write it in such a way, it also didn't work for them. So I think it's really, yeah. really important to trust your instincts, have the confidence to write what you want to write. And of course, then get feedback. But at the end For of sure. the day, I think um, as a Jewish woman, do what feels authentic and right for you. Authenticity is key. And it's so important when you're navigating the professional world, the personal world, just be true to yourself. I know that sounds corny, but I keep learning that lesson every day, more and more, um, especially professionally. Just be your core authentic self. And, um, and this is another thing, you know, I've thought about too. Um, a lot of times, you know, as a journalist, as a writer, there's a lot of emphasis on where one is publishing. You know, um, you want to get into the most prestigious print magazine. You want to get into the most prestigious newspaper, whatnot. But sometimes the places that maybe are a little less known will give you the space, the attention, and, 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 and you know, the word count where you can fully express yourself. 
And that is not to be overlooked. I always tell, you know, people that want to get into journalism, they're like, oh, I want to write for, you know, The Atlantic and The New York Times, which are both dream publications. But there's also smaller publications, you know, like that are so great and allow people more space. And those should not be overlooked because that's where you can really develop your voice. And I think that's incredibly important. Developing one's authentic voice is probably the best advice that I can give um, anybody coming up in the ranks of journalism or writing or even just being a, you know, a, a Jewish person uh, living in <laughs> anywhere in the world. Be your authentic, true self and you will never be disappointed. 100%. I think that's incredible advice. And I think it's something that especially now a lot of us need to hear. Um, and a lot of our listeners are, are young people going through a lot of similar things that you explained. So it's all really appreciated. And Melina, it's been an honor to have you and to speak with you today. Thank you so much for joining us here on Nice Jewish Girls. Thank you so much for having me. I hope that some of the things I said make sense. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Without doubt. Thank you so much. Thank you. It feels like we're living in this time where Jewish identity is experiencing a sort of renaissance. We are reclaiming pride in everything, even down to the stories behind our own names. Something as simple as the name Melina Saval carries so much gravity in its history, and that history deserves to be celebrated. My own name carries tremendous history. Jassy comes from Yassi, named after the town in Romania where my father's family came from. Bagaz, Calderon, Ashval, Rosen, stretching out for generations before me, telling the story of our exile, from Spain, from Iraq, from Yemen, from Russia. Miriam, my middle name, from my grandmother. Our names tell a story of survival in the face of insurmountable odds. When the state of global antisemitism feels heavy, I think about my own name, the history it holds. And I remember, we survive. And this, my friends, is where we'll leave you for today's episode of Nice Jewish Girls hopefully a bit smarter and a bit more inspired. Share your thoughts with us at podcasts at jewishimpact.com. And don't forget to join us next week when we'll be continuing this conversation with Eliza Lewin, president of the Louis D. Brandeis Center and a lawyer who has argued in front of the Supreme Court and changed legal precedent. Nice Jewish Girls is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Rivki Stern is our producer and I am your host, Julia Jassy. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related and subscribe to our other podcasts. And of course, follow Unpacked at all of the social media places. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. Talk to you later, ladies.